This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. In doing a, an oral history project, which is research facilitation, of this size and complexity, inevitably it's got a number of significant practical difficulties which we as a team seriously needed to think about and how did we work with this and also work around it. First of all was the scale of it. We'd committed to interviewing at least 60 high profile leading Commonwealth diplomats, heads of government, journalists, members of the Commonwealth, civil society and professional associations so we needed to go for range. We also needed to think seriously about covering the regional aspects of the Commonwealth. This is a global organisation and so to get the most appropriate level of engagement and coverage also from 1965 to 2010, immediately there are a number of issues that were coming front and foremost to our minds. The time involved in setting up the preparation, the research, getting in to talk to people was also part of it. And doing the interview, of course, was only uh, the first part of the production of knowledge coming out of the project. So that could involve in itself diplomacy of persuading these high-level people to look again at the interview and then to let go of their history. Now, when I'm talking about high-level people, we interviewed, I'm just going to do the list here, eight Prime Ministers, three, in fact now four, former Secretaries General of the Commonwealth, 15 Foreign Ministers, we interviewed uh, former Directors of the Political Affairs Division, and four Special Assistants. And unfortunately we didn't manage to capture more of a women's voice. There are important and high-level Commonwealth women in the project, but as a direct result, I think, um, or a direct reflection, of the hierarchies and the place of women in professional life and in diplomacy in the 60s, 70s and going into the 80s, unfortunately the, there was not a strong high level women's voice even though of course they formed half of the Commonwealth. So those I've indicated are the practical questions that we had to think about but then there were also when you're doing an interview what are issues that you need to bear in mind? Well we had obviously the series of research questions that we were doing, we had a semi-structured interviewing technique, we sent each an idea of what we want to talk about, and then very quickly it became apparent that what we'd have to do is to tailor each interview to the professional experience of the person that I was talking to. And I use the word I because I, I did, I would say, um, the bulk of the interviews. Philip interviewed three very important and high-level Indian diplomats, which is a fantastic contribution of India's place and view of the Commonwealth, which is very particular. Anyway, in these interviews that I was doing for these high-level people, it's very quickly apparent, when you're doing elite interviewing, that they want to tell you their story. So you can go in with your ideas of, these are the questions I want you to answer, and very quickly these high-profile, powerful political figures, very conscious of the importance of rhetoric, very conscience, conscious of their place in history, we determined they were going to tell you their story the way that they wanted. And so there was a, a degree of negotiation to try to get them to answer the questions that we wanted and then trying to tell the story in the way that they wanted. So they were owning a narrative. Um, then there was the aspect of the time that it would take to go through the interview checking and also how do you check what they're telling you is indeed an accurate reflection of what was going on at the time. This is why oral history needs to be read back against the record because each interview that you do is historically contingent. It's an engagement, uh, an experience between the interviewer and the interviewee at that particular point in time. The historical context, the contemporary context, is also very much part of that engagement, that experience. So if, as an interviewer, you want to try to get them to elaborate on mindsets, thinking processes, uh, personal likes and dislikes, how oh, that's very woven in the fabric of diplomacy, I think is so often overlooked. We wanted to use the original documents, but they weren't available in very large, uh, very large number of cases. So I needed to try to triangulate what one interviewer was saying against what another uh, person who could have been present at that time, who might have had an interesting and rather different view, 
what was their reflection, what was their perspective, so that you try to build up a more complex picture, a more complex understanding of actually what was going on at that particular time with the inevitable intellectual health warning that they're telling you their truth. And this is where memory is that fascinating but unstable aspect of historical recollection and it always needs to be treated with very great care. I've talked about the practical difficulties of organising a project of this scale, this breadth and this chronological time span. But I want to emphasise now the advantages that we had of working as a small team on this project. First and foremost, I think it's that you have a degree of standardisation of interviewer. Now, that's important because I could carry in my head my both explicit but also implicit impressions when engaging with the people that I was talking to because it enabled me to really develop an understanding of the mindset, how they saw how they viewed the concept of the Commonwealth as a practical association, or not, and where it sat in their world view as an ideal. The Commonwealth is a very complicated, indeed a unique association. It's got various aspects. It is the complete antithesis of the European Union, which is very top-heavy in bureaucratic terms, has a high degree of visibility. The Commonwealth is actually more like an iceberg. Most of its work goes on underneath the surface, it has a high level of visibility in the international media, probably principally because of the Queen, um, in the meeting every two years of the Commonwealth Heads of Government. But there's also the aspect of civil society organisations and professional organisations. Uh, there is the aspect of the intergovernmental institutions of the Secretariat, the Commonwealth Foundation and also the Commonwealth of Learning. Now, I've tried to emphasise those three pillars because that means then you need to understand, to try to get what is the modern Commonwealth. And when you're talking to people, if you can start to understand their way of thinking, their choice of words, their use of rhetoric, and also how they use that supposedly common language of English across the Commonwealth. Now, it has important and subtle variations according, according to region. Their use of language also varies very much from the working colloquial day-to-day -day use of English and how these high-level people like to use English on the page. I made earlier reference to these were high-profile people, very attentive to the importance of rhetoric, the power of words, how they crafted words, how they used them. And when you're an interviewer, you really need to listen and listen intently. Why do they choose that particular word? Why do they not substitute it for this? Why do they then manipulate and use it and stretch it in a certain way. These are all important verbal means of communication. Also as being the one interviewer, I could pick up on the non-verbal communication aspects of an interview. You can really see when somebody physically starts to relax in an interview, when they're amused, when they also start to physically move in a, you know, a gesture of discomfort in a chair, because you can think, now why is that going on? What is here? Why is this? And that's where you can start to push, gently, politely. I believe very firmly that honey catches more flies than vinegar. And so I was determined, that, and as was Philip, not to be um, Jeremy Paxman in this. I think that to be controversial in an interview is fundamentally counterproductive, although you can still be controversial in an ultimately very polite way. But you mustn't be aggressive. So in this exploration of language, we have also an emphasis on the literary value of the spoken word and where, in fact, English sits as a critical means of communication, how it helps to buoy up the Commonwealth. How, do, how does it help this extraordinary iceberg to float, it could be said, in international relations? Another interesting thing about being the only interviewer on a number of these interviews was that I could go for different angles. And Philip, I know, has made reference to the inside-outside approach that we tried to adopt, because operating within a Commonwealth bubble can lead to a self-validating rhetoric of the particular uh, benefits of this extraordinary association. But actually looking at the Commonwealth from outside really helps to give greater form and shape to this extraordinary, amorphous, sprawling association. In the same way that uh, those historians, those political scientists who've explored 
this question of identity through the exploration of other, that we only understand what it is within ourselves by projection of opposition onto the other. So it's in this process of othering that we really start to understand what is innate within ourselves. So that then slides into the intellectual difficulties that come with the, uh, this, a project of this size or the intellectual challenges that we needed to work with. So when you're looking at a hybrid creature such as the Commonwealth, how do you understand it? How do you explore what has been written about it? And the need then to go for different types of literature, to look for biographies of leading uh, contributors uh, to the Commonwealth's diplomacy, but to look at its varying forms and norms. 